Good evening. Welcome to tonight's uh, parent evening. My name is Stanley Philippe. I hope you're having uh, as positive a start uh, to your new year um, as possible. I also want to wish everyone a very happy hockey eve. Yes, tomorrow is the beginning of the brand new NHL season. And um, if you're like me, you're probably looking forward to seeing the Toronto Maple Leafs officially earn the title of Canada's favorite, most dominant team. So super excited uh, for hockey to be back uh, starting tomorrow night. But enough about that. Um, let's talk about what's going to go down uh, tonight. We have a really great event scheduled for you all. And again, thank you everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, so first thing we want to do is uh, have an introduction and an update to the application process uh, with Jen Sugar, who is the Director of Admission Services. Uh, we'll then hear from our students, uh, Ben, who is a Bachelor of Science student, Ryan in our engineering program, and Bell, who's doing a combined honors in journalism and humanities. We're going to have a conversation with each student to talk a bit more about uh, their experiences uh, at Carleton. And then we'll close things off with Sam Holmstrom, who is a student awards and financial aid expert. And she's going to help paint the financial picture as it pertains to your son or daughter's education. Um, so a lot of really great um, speakers you're going to hear from. We also want to hear from you. Um, so please uh, utilize tonight's live event Q&A uh, to ask your questions throughout uh, the entire event. You know, we've been having our CU Info Week uh, for the last couple of days. So of course, it started yesterday. And uh, each event, I'm noticing a lot of really great detailed questions being asked uh, by students. So I have a feeling that, you know, over the holidays, a lot of students were doing their research and looking things up and, and learning more about our university. And so hopefully uh, you have some awesome questions uh, for us. So, so again, please utilize the live event Q&A to ask your questions uh, throughout the night. Um, okay, so to begin officially, we want to start by acknowledging uh, our location. So uh, Carleton University acknowledges the location of its campus on a traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Now, uh, today I was looking at our website, carleton.ca, and the kind of headline um, article uh, talks a bit more about uh, our year, 2020, uh, and uh, recapping the year that was, some of the highlights. And for me, the biggest highlight uh, was Carleton's Indigenous Reconciliation Strategy. Um, it's called Kinemagawin, which means learning together. And uh, what we've been able to do with this new strategy is to come up with 41 calls to action that will really help us do just that, help us really learn together, create a more welcoming environment on our campus for, for all of our students and staff and faculty members, but especially for members of the Indigenous community. So really important uh, work that has been done and uh, really important for us to, uh, to get highlight um, just how um, how connected we are uh, to uh, to what's happening uh, in our communities and how we can make it again a more welcoming place uh, for all. So again, that's called a Kinemagwin. Uh, definitely take a look take a look at it on our website. Okay, so my goal this year uh, is to talk less and to smile more. Uh, and nothing puts a smile on my face quite like our next uh, speaker. Uh, she's a really great speaker, a lot of great information. So, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only. Jen Sugar. Thanks, Stan. Um, as Stan said, with maybe just a little bit too much gusto, my name is Jen Sugar. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Carleton University. And what I want to do tonight is I want to talk a little bit about the admission process, and I want to talk about the journey, um, about how students can uh, really make the most out of this, out of these next few months in terms of choosing the program that's right for them and some of the things that I think that students should be thinking about when they're looking ahead to a program um, at our university. So let's start with some of the tactical stuff. Let's start with some of the details because one of the first questions I get asked because we're in the midst of a pandemic and because the school year is so disrupted is how is Carleton going to be making offers of admission? Um, and so, in fact, when we look at how we're going to be making offers of admission this year, it's actually not that different from how we've made offers of admission in the past. Um, and so what we know for this year is that um, uh, students are going to be uh, receiving grades at a variety of different times 
of year because some students are functioning in the quadmester system, some students are functioning in the octomester system, and some students are functioning in the traditional semester system. But what happens for us is that we receive grades at four different times in the year. We've already received a, ground, a round of grades and that happened in November. We're about to receive another round of grades and that'll happen in February. We'll receive another round of grades in around uh, April uh, and then we'll receive grades at the end of the year. And what what happens is, is that at each time that we receive grades from the Ontario University Application Centre, we download the grades of students who have completed different grade 12 courses and we combine them with their grade 11 courses and we calculate an admission average. And so the only thing that is going to be a bit different this year is in the past, students would have had many more completed grade 12 grades um, by let's say April of this year of 2021 um, because they would have been halfway through their second semester of their grade 12 year. But what will happen is, is we're just going to keep using that combination of grade 12 and grade 11 grades as we go through the entire cycle. And so as we get more grade 12 grades, we drop off some of the grade 11 grades. But for any grade 12 grades that we happen to be uh, still waiting for, we'll just keep looking back to grade 11 to grab some of those grade 11 grades. So a good example is, is for example, if a student's applying to a program that requires grade 12 physics, but they're not taking that grade 12 physics until the last quadmester, until the last octomester, what we'll do is we'll look back to that grade 11 physics grade and we'll bring that forward as a placeholder until we can get that final grade 12 grade. And so it'll be a combination of grade 11 and grade 12 grades throughout, basically throughout the entire year um, as we calculate averages and as we start sending out offers of admission. So that's a little bit about the, how the offer process is going to work and, and it's what we call rolling offers of admission and it's very similar to what we've done in past years. But one of the things that students are sort of wrestling with now is what to apply to, what to choose. Um, and that's some of the questions that I get a lot when I talk to students. I don't know what to choose. I don't know what to major in. Um, and to be honest, this is the start of that. These types of events are the start of that research. And what we encourage students to do is to attend a lot of these different events. We have events like this. We have events in all different types of formats. We had some of our open houses at the beginning of the year. We'll have our March break program coming up. We have our spotlight events. We have a lot of different ways for students to engage with us, to engage with our faculty, to engage with staff, and to start asking questions and figuring out um, what programs sort of sing to them and what are the best fits for them. And so that's what we encourage students to start doing is to come to events like this so that they can ask those questions and get some of those details and they can figure out what works for them. And one of the best parts about, about our events is what's going to happen right after I finish talking, which is you'll be able to hear from our students. And there is no one better able to talk about decision process and student experience and how uh, how to come to that decision about majoring and or what to major in and what to come to Carleton to enjoy than hearing from our students. Um, our students were making these decisions not that long ago and so it's great to hear about their process and how they came to be where they are right now. So you can look forward to that tonight. But when students start asking, you know, what should I major in? What should I do? I, I always give the same advice. And what I say to students is major in what you enjoy, major in what you love, which honestly sometimes results in panic because I'll say major in what you love. And sometimes people say to me, I have no idea what I love. Um, I, I don't even know what that is. And that's OK. If you don't know what you love, that's OK, because that's part of the university journey for a lot of people is figuring out what you love, figuring out what you really enjoy um, and there are a lot of different options at Carleton and you don't necessarily need to graduate from the program that you start in so there are a lot of different things to kind of consider but you know some of that decision making does happen right now thinking about what do I love what do I want to major in and so on and especially now when I talk to students one of the things they say to me is you know I was talking to my uncle and he said I shouldn't major in anything else but engineering I should only major in engineering because it's the only thing that's going to get me a job. Should I really major in engineering? And what I say is, is if you love engineering, major in engineering. But if you don't love engineering, please don't major in engineering. And the reason why is because of this. When a student comes to Carleton, what happens is, is that no matter what you major in, 
if you major in, let's say, the Bachelor of Arts, and you attend full-time classes per week, you're going to attend five classes, three hours a week for each one. So that's 15 hours of class. What happens sometimes is students think that's not very much. That's I, I've got all the time in the world. But university is all about self-directed learning, and it's a lot about what you do outside of class. And if you want to get really good grades at university, you have to follow the two to one ratio, which means for every hour you spend in class, you should be spending two hours outside of class, reading, writing, preparing, going over notes, doing practice tests, uh, being engaged in study groups, all of these types of things. So when you apply the two to one ratio to a 15 hour um, class week, what you end up with is something more akin to a full time job. Um, you're doing basically 45 hours of work per week, and that's a lot of work. And if you think about any job you've ever had, whether it's a part time job or a full time job, if you think about that job and you think about a job that you've absolutely hated, you know that when it was time to do that job, you weren't getting out of bed in the morning going, yeah, this is going to be great. I love going to my job. You were dragging yourself in. It was difficult. It was hard to get yourself motivated. It was hard to get in there and do what you needed to do. It's the exact same thing if you try to major in something that you don't enjoy. It's dif difficult to get in there and do what you need to do. And why is it so important for you to do that, to get in there and do what you need to do? This is the key. University is about transferable skills. University teaches you a lot of things, but university teaches you how to think, how to work in groups, how to work alone, how to deal with vast quantities of information, how to write at an extremely high level, how to take in information, how to present, how to do all of these types of things. They, we teach it to you in a subject area, but no matter what you major in at Carleton, you're going to be leaving with these transferable skills. And this is key because those skills are how you're going to market yourself to an employer four years from now when you graduate. When an employer says to you, what can you do for me? You can say, I have these transferable skills. I have high level reading skills. I have high level writing skills. I can work on my own. I can work in groups. I can deal with vast quality quantities of information. I can synthesize things and boil them down to the essence so that I can explain them to other people. That's what university allows you to have. And what you need to remember is that we're not training you for a particular job. We're training you to think so that you can have any career that you want. And what you need to remember is that a lot of the careers and a lot of the jobs that are going to exist four years from now don't exist right now. But that's OK, because we're not training you to do a thing. We're training you to think so that you can be marketable in that job market when you get out there. And that's why that's so critical for you to really major in what you love so that when you walk away from Carleton, you will have taken 100% of those transferable skills with you. Because if you're not there, if you're not paying attention, if you're going to class only 35% of the time, then you're not gonna walk away with those full transfer transferable skills. But if you're there and you're interested and you're engaged, you will. So as you look forward, what I want you to think about is this. Carleton's an amazing place. It's an amazing place filled with amazing people. And what those people want to do is they want to help you grow. They want to help you learn. They want to help you look at your environment and ask questions. And that's what that's what's going to happen, because as you come and start your university journey at Carleton, you are going to grow. You're going to grow. You're going to change. You're going to incorporate new ideas. And it'll be amazing all of the different things that you'll be able to be exposed to and that you'll be able to learn. We're going to challenge you, but that's going to be the best part of your experience. And so what I would recommend for you is to think about that. And right now, as you're doing your research, to think about asking questions, about asking questions, about figuring out what's out there what's there for um, you to experience when you come here to campus. But then once you get here to campus, keep asking questions, keep asking questions, keep being curious, because that's what's going to allow you to get the maximum about a uh, uh, maximum amount from your university ex experience. And so as you go through tonight and as you keep asking those questions and as you keep um, 
following your journey, trying to figure out what you're interested in and what you're going to major in and what you love, good luck with that because this is just the beginning of an amazing process that's going to see you grow and change. And really, one of the things that we look forward to is we love this part now when students are just getting started, but we also love the part at the end when we get to see you cross that stage at graduation, being successful and having taken all of that information in, because that's some of our proud, that's some of our proudest moments is watching our students become graduates. So good luck with your research and please, if you have any questions, make sure you ask them in the chat so that all the great people that are here tonight can answer your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jen, for, for that. It's really great to hear about, you know, the, the intention behind um, our university and what we're intending to do and offer to our um, students. Uh, and it's also great to hear from the students themselves to see if we are meeting those expectations and how they are maximizing uh, the opportunities, the resources, and the, the skill development that is essential to, to again, to what we do uh, at Carleton U. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, bring uh, to the screen uh, the first of our three awesome students uh, that you're going to uh, to hear from tonight. Um, his name is Ben, and uh, he's got uh, hopefully a lot of great things to say. Um, so Ben, first off, uh, thank you so much for joining us, and, and how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself, Stanley? I'm doing very well. All right, so let's start with the, that money question. So um, why did you end up applying to Carleton University? And if I can tag on to that, what was it like uh, applying to, to our school uh, and, and that moment when you actually got in uh, to university? Wow, okay. Uh, this is going a long way back now. I'm in my fourth year now. So this, I applied to Carleton in what would have been 2016. And why I applied to Carleton ultimately boiled down to the feel of it. I came and did a campus tour of Carleton in November of 2016, and I liked the feel of the campus. I liked the feel of Ottawa. Um, I'm from a, another city in southern Ontario called Waterloo, which is about a five hour drive away, and I kind of just wanted to go somewhere else to explore a new city. And for me, Carleton and Ottawa really just felt like the right fit, and that was ultimately the biggest reason for me. So you, you talk a bit about uh, the, the tour experience and, and obviously we're all uh, living through a, a global pandemic uh, currently. Um, so maybe you can uh, add a bit more to that, that feeling. Maybe you can describe it more what it felt like uh, your first time on campus and how that kind of spilt into uh, your, your class uh, experience. Definitely. Um, so I'm, I guess, like Stanley mentioned, unfortunately, um, none of us are going to be able to go back to Carleton for a while hopefully next year. Um, but what I really liked about the campus at Carleton is that it's got a very homey feel. Um, Carleton is pretty much self-contained in a little area. It's bordered by the by the Rideau River, by the canal, and then one street. But it very much feels like its own little village. So that kind of sense of community and also just the idea that you can walk from any point on campus to any other point on campus in at most 15 minutes really appealed to me uh just having everything in one place and feel feeling like it was very self-contained now you're in your fourth year maybe you can talk a bit more about um the skills that you've developed and, and gained throughout your program uh and especially thinking about you know uh, taking that journey back in time and in year one and what your expectations were like and then now that you're in year four, you know, what were those connections between uh, the classes and the skills you got early on? OK, um, so I guess I'll start off by mentioning that I'm in the Bachelor of Science, but more specifically, I'm in the Combined Chemistry and Physics program. And something that's unique about science and being in classes like Chemistry and Physics is not only do you have lectures, but you also have labs that you go to as well. And Labs are a lot of work. Um, you will learn to love and to hate labs. It's not really something you can escape as a science student, but they are really, really cool in what you learn from them. Um, in first year, labs generally start off being a lot more structured. You're given the exact manual of what you need to do. But as you go further through university, uh, it becomes more of an experiment that you kind of develop yourself. So I think one of the skills that I found really cool going through Carleton, going through this Bachelor of Science program from year one all the way up to my fourth year now, is kind of going through the process of being able to develop my own experiments now. 
And it's really cool when you get to third year um, or even second year. In my second year optics physics lab, for example, there's one experiment where they have an unidentified gas light source. And the experiment is to use spectroscopy to figure out what that light source is based on the emission spectrum. So you have a kind of rough guideline of how to approach it, but it's completely up to you to go collect the data, go analyze that data and figure out what it's telling you, which is something I found really cool about labs at Carleton. Yeah, it's it's an application, right? Like being able to actually uh, apply some of the the theories and some of the concepts that you're you're working through uh, in your classrooms. Now, uh, mm -hmm. this afternoon we had a conversation about um, future the future career goals and aspirations and and opportunities that are available for our students as they're um, looking towards graduation. So I'm curious to know, Ben, uh, did you um, have a chance to explore some work opportunities, uh, maybe co-op or other uh, internship opportunities uh, related to to your degree? I have, yes. And uh, actually, I'm on a co-op term right now, which is really interesting. I'm on an eight month co-op term with Environment and Climate Change Canada doing data, doing air quality data analysis for them. Uh, so that's been really interesting. And I've had one more co-op before that where I was a research assistant in one of the chemistry labs on campus. Uh, I've really enjoyed both of those experiences a lot. OK, so I, I want to I want to uh, jump on that. Um, the Environment Canada uh, co-op yeah. that you're currently uh, yeah. uh, talk a bit about um, what was it like kind of starting that job uh, and now that you're I believe a few months into it yeah. uh, or when when did you actually start the co-op placement? It was uh, in September I started it so this is my second half of the term right now I'm doing it. Okay so so now that you've had a, a few months of experience what are you learning about the quote-unquote real world as it pertains to uh, this work experience that you're hoping to bring back to the classroom? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing I've taken away from this experience is that what you learn in university, what you learn in your classes is going to help you in your job, but it's not going to be what you do in your job. Um, the cool thing about working there is I've had the opportunity to learn a whole lot, bunch of new things. Uh, there's lots of software. For example, there's this one thing called Power BI that you can create data visualizations with that I'd never even heard of before I started this job, but that's like half of what I do now. So. I think having the opportunity to learn these new things is really cool and I can take that back to my courses. But also what I learned from my courses is kind of how to approach these problems. Um, I didn't learn how to work in Power BI in my program, but I did learn how to do some basic programming and that's very transferable to what I'm doing now and has definitely given me the skills to, to be successful. Awesome. We'll leave that at that, Ben, but thank you so much for, for painting that picture and, and good luck with the rest of your co-op placement. Yeah, thanks, Stanley. So next up, we're going to bring Ryan into the conversation and, and Ryan is in uh, the uh, engineering uh, program here at Carleton. So Ryan, uh, thank you for joining us and how are you doing? Doing really well. Uh, thank you for asking. Awesome. So same question to you to start things off. You know, what was kind of the uh, the uh, I guess the trigger that led to you applying to Carleton University and applying to I believe civil engineering uh, at Carleton specifically. Uh, well, I applied to a bunch of programs at Carleton, uh, and by the end of my first term in high school, I kind of determined I want to go into engineering. Uh, so what really drove me to choose Carleton was the Pullman Center for students with visual and non-visual disabilities. Uh, they help out a lot. Uh, I learned about it through one of these nights uh, five years ago, uh, a little while ago, but it showed that I would get all the resources to help me get my engineering degree, as well as if I needed anything throughout uh, in terms of like certain accommodations, they would be there. And so far, it's been amazing to have them. Now, full disclosure, I'm a pretty old guy now, Ryan. I'm going into my 40s this year. Um, so but back in my day when I was in high school, they would always paint this picture of university being this place where, you know, no one's going to care about your success and you won't get any support. What's it been like for you? You mentioned the Palmetto Center. What's it been like for you kind of navigating university, uh, at the Carleton University experience and, and what type of support networks, uh, including the Palmetto Center, that you've been able to to utilize to help uh, achieve the goals that you have for, for yourself? Uh, well, in my first year, I didn't really know what was going to happen uh, with everything, but they, uh, a lady in the 
PMC, Laura, she walked me through all the accommodations, how exams work, assignments, quizzes will work with getting accommodations. So for me, uh, I have extra time in a different location during exams. So one thing that stressed me out in high school was exams and going to university, uh, it was stressing me out even more. So they basically uh, sat down, explained all the processes. And the one nice thing was they also uh, explain to my parents through one of these nights how it was going to work, how I was going to get help. And the I think the nicest thing is even if it's a weekend and you require help with trying to get an accommodation of a class or a quiz, I've had it before where Sunday night um, my professor forgot to book something and uh, my coordinator actually, I think it was 11.50 at night, and she made sure my accommodations were set up for the next morning at 8 a.m. for that quiz. That's awesome. That's really good to hear, and, and it's important to to note that, you know, that there, there are services that are available, and, and, and there are ways of tapping into those services as, as early as, as year one. Now, with, with engineering, I know there's uh, kind of that, that first year that's pretty common. Uh, we call it a common core first year. But as you've now navigated into your upper year of the program, uh, what's been some of the kind of the standout skills that you've been able to acquire um, that you didn't have before? Uh, one of the biggest skills, I would say, is technical writing. Uh, in your first year, you learn a little bit about it. Second year, that's when you really get introduced. Uh, the real course that kind of throws you Kind of in the deep end is uh, it's a materials course. They have you actually work hands on in our uh, super lab, uh, make your own concrete and then take it over to a compressor and basically cr crush it to death. Uh, so you make 10 cylinders over uh, six weeks, you crush them all and then they give you all the data uh, and then you go write a technical report that's about 50 to 100 pages long. Uh, TAs are there to help you, but I found that as a very helpful skill because you don't really get taught in high school how to do that. And that's what I'm looking forward to use in the field because, yeah. Love that. Now, if you were uh, sitting down uh, with a group of students, uh, high school students, and, and they were asking you for your, you know, your best words of wisdom, uh, what would you share? What would you say for students who are uh, looking to, uh, to apply to Carleton uh, for this upcoming year? I would say look at it going in that you're going to be in class come September and that whatever degree you choose uh, going in right now, you're not stuck with it. If you want to change, you can change. Uh, so if say you're choose to go into engineering like I did, but after the first few months you want to change, you can totally do that. So you're not stuck where you are. You do have the option to move wherever you want to go. So don't think that your only decision uh, for the rest of your life is right now. You can change your degree after first term, after second year. I have a friend that just changed their degree after four years of engineering um, and now they're in environmental studies. So you, yeah, that's the word of wisdom I would say. Don't think you're stuck with anything. Love that. It's it's the opening chapter of their their post secondary book. So there's there's lots more story to be told. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for for sharing those thoughts and uh, and wish you best of of luck uh, for this uh, upcoming year. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to wrap up our conversation with our students with Bell. Um, so Bell, uh, first off, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's uh, the the question I like to open with every student. It will be the same one I'll ask you, uh, which is, you know, what will encourage you to. Uh, to apply to Carleton University and what was that process like actually uh, uh, selecting a program and getting in? Um, well, I applied to the Journalism and Humanities program and um, it was really just the program. Um, it's like really well known and well regarded. Um, so that is why I applied. And um, yeah, there, there's really not another program that I found like it in Canada. Um, so I wanted to go into journalism. There are a few other options, but I felt the combination with humanities um, would make for a really well-rounded education. Yeah, it's it's one of our of our unique combinations that we do offer that that Bachelor of Journalism in Humanities. And so going into it, you obviously had some expectations. So uh, what was it like, you know, taking those first few classes of your degree, and and how were you able to make it much more, I guess, personalized or or customize it to what you wanted to get out? Um, of your university experience? 
Yeah, well, um, this program is fairly unique because it's uh, relatively sort of constrained to the courses. So you don't have like a lot of choice, but you have a variety of courses that you take. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, hold them in your two hands there. Um, but to your first point, um, my expectations going in, um, I'm not really sure. It was definitely in first year, very, very challenging. Um, I think I wrote around 40 essays and papers in my first year. Um, uh, it was a lot, but I, both of the programs are fairly small. So I was guided really uh, by my professors. They really, really care. And they're really, really passionate about their teaching subject. Um, so I was able to sort of get through those initial, you know, not even hiccups, just nerves of, you know, new expectations from high school. Yeah. Was there was there a class that, that you took that made you kind of realize, yeah, I've, I've arrived, like this is exactly where I want to be? And, and if so, what was that class uh, about? Um, gosh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I mean, last year, uh, I mean, it didn't take till third year to, uh, to realize that this is where I wanted to be. But one of my favorite courses in my entire degree was um, each year in humanities, you have a core course. So last year was 3000. So Hans 3000 was all about literature and we studied Shakespeare. Um, and that was the kind of stuff that I really liked in high school. Um, and I sort of looked forward um, to that throughout my entire uh, first three years. And when we finally did it, um, it was it was just really great to sort of analyze and look at these types of literature from um, a higher up level um, and learn from incredible uh, professors and, and that sort of thing. Awesome. Now, you know, sometimes when we talk about skills, you know, it's it there are cases where some programs are, I guess, it's easier to understand the connection between the material and the skills that you're developing. Uh, with some of our social sciences, some of the students have this misconception of, well, what am I going to learn and how am I going to uh, apply those skills in a real life setting? So maybe you can talk a bit about the skills you've been able to acquire in, in journalism and humanities and, and how you see it kind of uh, playing out and, and being utilized. Uh, when you go into the next phase of your life? Yeah, so the reason I enrolled in journalism and humanities is because I, I really believe that you can't sort of like write about the present if you don't fully understand the past. So humanities is sort of a amalgamation of political science, religion, um, philosophy, uh, literature, like a whole bunch of subjects. Uh, so that sort of gives me one side of my brain to think about. Um, and then the journalism is a lot more straightforward. Um, some of the skills that I've had to develop is just organization above all of them and, and time management because um, there's a lot of reading in humanities and um, there's a lot of things in journalism that you can't do at night, whether that be um, interviewing sources or um, like calling people those types of things, those have to be done during business hours. So um, it's a lot of balancing those types of things. Um, and yeah. Now you mentioned, you know, you can't really write about the present without learning about the past. So if present Bell were to talk to past Bell, let's say grade 12 Bell, uh, what would you give as like uh, words of wisdom or, or pieces of advice to either make the process a bit easier or to make it even more enjoyable than it may have been when you were in grade 12? Um, I would say probably something along the lines of enjoy it, enjoy the last bits of grade 12, certainly, um, and definitely don't too, put too much pressure on yourself, um, both in high school and university. Um, not that you shouldn't take courses seriously, um, but you don't want to put too much stress on yourself that it becomes overwhelming. Um, and the number one piece of advice that I say to any of, you know, people that I know that are entering university is, um, I mean, no matter on the program, but especially if you're going to a bit of a smaller program, um, like talk to the professors, uh, go to their office hours. They want to know you. They want to know your their students. Um, and, you know, there's nothing better than having um, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a professor about material or about getting advice about something, your you know, future career or the topic at hand. Um, so that would be my number one piece of advice. Perfect. Well, Bell, uh, thank you so much for for joining us, and uh, and uh, best of luck uh, for uh, in the remainder of your your time at Carleton. Thank you. 
So I, I want to thank uh, Bell, Ryan, and Ben for for sharing their story and and for telling us so much more about. Uh, the university experience from uh, a student's perspective and they're going to stick around throughout the evening. So if you have any questions for, for our awesome students, uh, please uh, ask them in the live and Q&A. They'll take a look at that uh, Q&A and, and hopefully answer some of the questions we have uh, for them. Now, when you know parents and students are, are thinking about that post-secondary journey, that the program of study is really important to, to find, but financing the education is also part of the, uh, the equation. And so to help you kind of uh, understand the ways that we can uh, assist in financing your education and also how students can benefit from uh, some of the opportunities that are available, I'd like to bring our final speaker to the screen, uh, Sam Holmstrom, who again is a member of our financial aid office who has um, a lot of really great information to share. So uh, Sam, the uh, the floor, the, the video, I guess, the screen uh, is yours. Hi everyone, thanks, Sen. Um, as Sen mentioned, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm the student awards and financial aid assistant at uh, the awards office at Carleton. Um, so I'm gonna kind of break our, my talk up into a, a couple sections. I'm gonna start off with the scholarships and bursaries portion, um, which I'll explain. Uh, then I'm going to go into OSAP and then I'm going to round out with dates and deadlines. So that's kind of how I'm going to tackle this um, because it is a big topic and there's a lot of information to digest. Um, so at Carleton, students have access to the three main categories. Scholarships and bursaries are, are awards that are issued by Carleton to help offset the cost of school. Um, scholarships are awarded based on academic performance while bursaries are based on financial need. Then the third kind of category is the government financial aid. Um, while most provinces have their own financial need and they, they are able to talk about that, today I'm going to focus on uh, Ontario's government financial aid, which is the Ontario Student Assistance Program, or more commonly known as OSAP. Um, if there is someone in the audience who's out of province, rest assured that we do have someone in the office that can help you out with it, but it's best to consult the province's financial aid um, directly. So I'm going to start off with scholarships and bursaries. Scholarships are based on that academic performance. For incoming students, entrance scholarships are automatically assessed when an application for admission to Carleton is submitted. Students with an admissions average of over 80% or higher, or 80% or higher, sorry, um, are automatically awarded that scholarship. Uh, these entrance scholarships range in value from $4,000, which is released as $1,000 per year for four years, up to $16,000 or $4,000 per year for four years. That four years portion is really important. Um, so the depending on the criteria for renewing the scholarship, that, that's how we determine what, which years the students um, receive their scholarship. Um, and that criteria is outlined when the student receives their offer of admission if they do have a scholarship. Um, in addition to these automatically assessed scholarships, we do have a few entrance scholarships that assess different things. So they have particular um, applications that need to be submitted as well. The main group of those um, it, are our prestige scholarships. To be eligible for these awards, students must have an admissions average of 90% or higher and be able to display some leadership qualities. Uh, usually students acquire these through participating in extracurricular activities. Um, there's also a reference portion of that application, so that's where we really get to see a lot of the leadership qualities that students possess. Um, there's one application for all of the prestige scholarships, of which there are 25. They range from about $20,000 to a full domestic tuition. So they're pretty advantageous if you're if you are eligible. I really encourage you to apply for those. Um, students uh, will be needing to submit the application form and the one reference letter for that um, that process. I know a big concern for a lot of students and their parents are uh, the impact of the lockdowns and the current pandemic situation on extracurricular activities. Rest assured, everyone's in the same boat, so we're going to see a little bit less of those extracurricular activities just 
in general across these applications. Um, and you're not held to a specific standard when you are putting in those extracurricular activities. So if this past year you haven't been able to participate in many, you'll still be considered for the award because you're able to put up from the past four years. So just make sure to encourage your, your student if they're a little hesitant because of that piece to just go for it and list as much as they can um, because it's it's really a, a strong, a good, a good award to go for those prestige scholarships. The applications for this, these processes are, um, are is March 1st, so there's still a little bit of time um, to submit that and to gather references and all of that fun stuff. Um, aside from the prestige scholarships, there are also six other scholarships that have varying criteria. Um, so because they have varying criteria, uh, criteria, I can't really give you a general sense as to what we're looking for in those scholarships. The best thing to do for those other entrance scholarships is to go onto the awards office website and review them carefully um, because the, each application will kind of directly address what the eligibility criteria are for those. Moving kind of away from the academic performance, I'm going to go into talking about bursaries now. Bursaries, as mentioned, are those financial needs based awards. Um, since we don't have access to this information from your admissions application, they do require a separate application as well. The general entrance bursary is assessed by completing the entrance bursary application on Carleton Central. To be eligible for this bursary, the students must have applied and been offered um, admission to, to an undergraduate degree. The student must be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident. The student has demonstrated financial need and will also be applying for government financial aid. So as long as those ones are the eligibility or the student meets those eligibility criteria, we will be assessing and awarding an entrance bursary as long as they complete the application as well. If students have demonstrated leadership abilities through participating in those extracurricular activities, they can also apply for leadership entrance bursaries. There are seven of these bursaries that range from $5,000 to full tuition plus $1,000 for books. So these are some pretty advantageous awards as well. Each of the leadership awards have, again, differing eligibility criteria. So it's important for students to review these applications before submitting them. Um, the applications are available on our website, so I would encourage you to look through those and just see if there are, if you meet any of them. Again, I can't really go into all of the details about them, um, but they, I would really encourage you to look at them um, because they can be quite, quite valuable. Um, these are all of the internal awards offered at Carleton, so the um, entrance scholarships, some of the other entrance scholarships that require applications such as the prestige application, entrance bursaries, and leadership entrance bursaries. In addition to these, I would encourage you to look on our website for, we have three databases that are linked on our website. These, the awards listed on these can be um, applied to by people across Canada. So these are known as external awards um, and you would need to review them carefully because they do have different eligibility criteria. But if you're looking for more things to apply for, that would be a good place to check as well. So moving on from internal and external awards, a big portion of funding for a lot of students comes through OSAP um, or the Ontario Student Assistance Program. It's a provincial aid program that offers grants and loans to help Ontario students pay for their university education. OSAP uses a number of factors to determine eligibility and values of funding, including tuition, course load, financial and the financial resources of the family and the student themselves. So the four most common sources of financial resources that we see coming in for high, from high school students are number one, expected parental contribution. And this is based on the prior tax year. So for the upcoming 2021-2022 academic year, we will be using the 2020 tax year to determine um, the, the parental contribution. This also takes into consideration the size of the family and the number of children attending post-secondary simultaneously. 
Second most common financial resource is the expected award income from Carleton as, and other agencies. Carleton will report any awards that are uh, the student receives that are directly from Carleton, so those entrance scholarships, entrance bursaries, we will report those for the student. However, um, it's the student's responsibility to report any external awards that they receive. So that will you'll see that on the application, but just in case you're a little bit concerned about that, um, that's kind of how we different, differentiate who reports what when it comes to award income. The third common for, source of financial um, or financial resources are the, is the student's expected employment income. So this is if the student is planning on working part time during the year, um, they will need to report that on the application as well. There is a threshold. Um, they, I don't think they're changing it next year, but I don't want to give a different definitive threshold, but it will be stated on the application when you go to apply. So um, just keep that in mind as well. Um, the fourth most common financial resource is any significant savings that the student has in their name. So this isn't um, like if if the family has significant savings, that's not what we're what needs to be included. It's if the student does. This doesn't include things like cars. So if they're going to be having a car to get back and forth um, home and school, that's not included on the application. But if you have any doubts about this particular section, because it is a wide catch all, um, just give us a, uh, either give us a call or give us an email or send us an email and uh, we can help you out determining that as well. So applying to OSAP is a two stage process. The first stage you could do right now with the student. Um, it's setting up the OSAP uh, profile on the OSAP website. Uh, you can't submit the application yet, but this does help prep the profile to receive some information um, when it comes time to applying to OSAP. During this time, there is an option when setting up the pro profile to link OUAC with OSAP. This will get make stage two a little bit easier, so just keep that in mind. I'll de describe that a little bit in stage two. In order to set up the OSAP pro profile, um, the student needs their SIN number and they, they need their date of birth. That's it. They don't need any additional information at this time. Stage two is actually submitting the OSAP application. The application opens in the spring just as high school, the high school year is winding down, usually around May, June. Um, but the nice thing is if you linked the OUAC um, account with the OSAP account, um, we'll have a verified email. So once the application becomes available, then they will send you a quick email and say, hey, you can apply now. Um, so that's a good a good check mark in that that side um, to do that OUAC linking. Additionally, when the OSAP application opens, the application system will automatically populate all of the programs that the student applied for through their OUAC account. So what that does is it pulls in all the program information, how, what time they're starting, all of that information, and the student then just needs to go through and verify that information to make sure it's correct, and then complete the rest of the application. So it's a little bit of a step up through the process. Um, it's important though, if you see anything there that looks strange, like there's a program that's different, there's just anything that looks strange, you can reach out to us and we can help fix that and kind of figure out why that pulled in. Um, sometimes if another an alternate offer was um, created for the student through the application process, that can kind of sometimes show up a little bit weird on the OSAP process. It's not a perfect system, but it's a wonderful um, step up. So I kind of mentioned it a little bit, but where is the awards office in this crazy process of financial aid? Um, so in addition to answering general questions about our scholarships and bursaries programs, we're the first point of contact for students as they prepare for and complete the OSAP pro process. So as they're going in to submit the application, if they have any questions about anything there, um, if they submitted the application and realize that something has changed partway through the application or there's something incorrect that popped up, um, they can reach out to us. 
Um, and as we go through school, um, the sport, support doesn't end when your OSAP application has ended. If your circumstances change while at school, we can also help you navigate that process. Um, so at any point, if there are any questions, reach out to us via phone or email. Um, we're here to help through navigating sometimes pretty complex situations. Um, so that kind of wraps up some of the OSAP talk. Um, it's important to, at this point, realize that there are quite a few dates and deadlines coming up for financial aid. The first one I mentioned earlier is that prestige scholarship application. That's March 1st. Um, so it's important to get ahead on that. Um, a lot of the time students who they'll submit their application for that process and then the reference will come much later. So it's good to start early for that one. April 2nd is the next deadline. Uh, that is for all of those other entrance scholarships and the leadership entrance bursary application. Um, again, good to start early with those because you never know uh, in, the, in the age of, of COVID, um, we want to make sure the applications show up properly on the PDS. And if you run into any tech issues, we can help you out with that. As long as it happens a little earlier, um, it's much easier to, to do then. Um, spring 2021, that's when the OSAP application is released. I would really encourage uh, students to link their, their OSAP or start their OSAP profile right now so that they're notified the instant the OSAP application is available. Um, it's, it's easier, it's better to start early for the OSAP application. We do recommend June 30th to have the OSAP application submitted in the mo for the most part. Because we get such a large influx, influx during the beginning of the year, we want to make sure that money goes out to students as fast as possible. So we recommend that date be June 30th. Um, June 30th is also the entrance bursary application deadline. That's the one that they submit through Carleton Central. So there's still some time for that one. So if you haven't received an offer of admission yet, you still have some time to complete that application and you don't need to be too stressed about that one yet. Um, so that kind of wraps up my presentation. I'm going to be sticking around also to answer any Q&A's that pop in. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam, for, uh, for giving us a great update on uh, the awards and financial aid uh, picture. And uh, of course, uh, continue to uh, to visit our awards website for more information on, on anything related to and scholarships, bursaries, uh, provincial uh, kind of financial aid and, and, and so on. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for uh, for tuning in to tonight's event. It was a lot of fun hearing from our, our students, hearing from uh, from Jen Sugar, Director of Admission Services, and, and we just heard again from, from Sam Holmstrom from our awards and financial aid office. And it was great hearing from all of you. You know, a lot of cool questions were asked throughout the night. There was a question uh, that came in a couple of minutes ago uh, asking about um, if Carleton will offer incoming students workshops or guidance on how to succeed in university before the fall semester begins. And I'm happy to say that, yes, we are going to do just that. And uh, this week is our CU Info Week, and it's designed to kind of give students a bit of a refresher as to um, who we are uh, with presentations like our, our general presentation happening tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time uh, to give students more information on how to successfully apply to our school. And we have a presentation on the application process tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. And of course, to connect with our parents and, and Tonight uh, was the first of two that we'll be having uh, uh, this week. So if you have any uh, friends uh, that weren't able to tune into tonight's event, encourage them to, to check out our second parent evening uh, this Thursday uh, at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And then throughout the next uh, few weeks and months, we're going to be offering a lot of different events uh, through Microsoft Teams, through Instagram Live. We have a brand new podcast that you can check out on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and so on. Um, so a lot of really great resources that are available for you to really understand First of all, first off, who we are, but also how we can help and how we can support your son or daughter as they are uh, working their way towards their post-secondary home. So yes, we will be there every step of the way and please continue to visit, up, visit us on our website, admissions.carlton.ca, as well as on Instagram, Twitter, and Future, at, and Twitter and Facebook at Carlton underscore future. Okay, I promise to talk less, but here I am talking more than I need to. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, my name is Stanley Philippe. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope to see you at Carleton uh, in the fall of 2021. Take care.